Alright, so we're going to do a double take. Alright, welcome to the College of Complexes, everybody. My name's Don, and I'm going to be the moderator this evening. Uh, now, our program tonight is that we have our speaker is our speaker is, is Okay, our speaker is Miguel Del Toral. Um, he's uh, the chairman of the local Chicago chapter of Socialist Party USA. He's going to be talking about the Socialist Party and about uh, the presidential campaign tonight. I think so. And All right. uh, without any further ado, let's have a warm welcome for our speaker, Miguel Del Toro. Hey, Miguel. Hey, Miguel. Okay. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Remember, you're being filmed. Oh, I'm a... Okay. Hello? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's there. You just, just speak normally. Speak normally? You, you, they can hear you. Okay, perfect. Hello everybody, my name is uh, Miguel Del Toro and I am chairman of the Socialist Party USA Chicago chapter. And I've been chairman of the Chicago Socialist Party for about four years now. I've been a member for just about as long. And uh, I represent the uh, Young People Socialist League in the city of Chicago as well. We are a democratic socialist multi-tendency organization and we are a political party in the United States. And, uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> It'll come to you. And we are also uh, running a political candidate for office, uh, President of the United States. Uh, the candidate is Mimi Sotasek. I'm so sorry, honey. Oh, don't worry about it. Our candidate is Mimi Sotasek, and our vice president is Angela Walker from Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And,. We are running a campaign that challenges the notion of normal campaigns. Uh, in standard political campaigns, you run to win political office. Mimi Soltisik's campaign is one of community organizing. And so what our presidential campaign is about isn't so much winning the presidency because we don't believe that uh, socialism can be won through the ballot box. Uh, we believe that socialism will only be won by people working together and building communities to eventually overthrow the system of oppression, the system of capitalism. And as such, we direct our efforts towards local campaigns, so we encourage all members and any members to uh, run for local office, where you would have usually larger um, concentrations of uh, power which you could use to empower your own communities. And we also encourage the use of grassroots organization and community building. So this is the focus of our presidential campaign. Uh, just last week, uh, last Monday, our presidential candidate, Mimi Soltisik, was here in Chicago downtown. And he gave a presentation on what we stand for, what our, what our values are, the values of the preciousness of every man, woman, and child, and the necessity of uh, ascending beyond this predatory system of capitalism. And the urgency of doing so requires us to think beyond mere ballots. So in our sense, we believe that we need people to start getting active in the communities, whatever that may be. Uh, we can help provide resources, we can help provide uh, the, the guiding path in any way that, uh, any way that the people wish. But we do not want to tell people what to do. We want to tell people that they themselves have the power to overthrow the system. And as such, this is our presidential campaign. This is the basis of our campaign. And I believe this is what best represents our party uh, politically. The Socialist Party USA, in addition to being a, a democratic socialist organization, we are a revolutionary organization. And we also believe that um, despite the fact that we are an umbrella organization, that reforms ultimately will not save the system, will not save humanity. We need a new system. We need something different. We need something new. We need to ascend beyond this, and we need to create it now before either the overpopulation, whether nuclear war, whether climate, whether poverty destroys humanity. And as such, we commit ourselves to direct action in addition to electoral politics. Uh, we believe direct action gets the goods, and we believe the only way we can put any change in our communities is to become part of our communities to ensure that the people themselves are supported and taken care of, not only by the party, but by the community members. 
And I, as chairman of the Chicago local, have overseen many direct action campaigns in the city. Uh, our Chicago local is uh, focused on two major campaigns, uh, labor and housing. There are five major campaigns in the Socialist Party USA. There's anti-war, eco-socialism, the prison industrial complex, housing, and labor. And so in Chicago, uh, our locals, well, in general, nationally, our locals are free to choose whatever uh, cha or whatever campaigns we wish to follow. We're rather autonomous in that regard, which I also love about the Socialist Party. There's no top-down directive. It is not a democratic centralist organization. The locals have autonomy to do whatever they feel is best and whatever is uh, best for whatever fits their uh, situations in their communities. As such, here in Chicago, we are facing some of the worst amount of displacement and gentrification throughout the city, especially on the north side, which directly affects disabled, elderly, single families, and people that are financially insecure, as well as the homeless. And as such, we have a direct action campaign against this, which we have been, uh, we have been very busy working on uh, to combat. We try to start, we, we've tried to start working with several organizations to promote community land trust formation and tenant union organization. And we believe that this, in the south side communities, which we are most active, uh, will help us be able to build the amount of base and uh, community that will allow us to build a sustainable society, at least within our own neighborhoods, and to be able to keep workers and families inside their own homes without getting pushed out by developers and businessmen politicians. As such, we have also worked with Arise Chicago, which is uh, faith, labor, or their the motto is faith, labor, and action, but they are uh, they are a progressive uh, union in which they work with undocumented workers against wage theft. And this ties directly to our housing campaign as well, because if a worker can't get paid, the worker can't feed his family, and the worker can't pay his rent. And in this day and age, rent keeps going up. So the two are interlinked. Everything in our society is intertwined, so we feel it's necessary to work on multiple fronts to ensure that we have a cohesive and coherent campaign to fight for workers' rights and fight for the housing of our own citizens. Uh, we have, in the past month of September, we've been very busy. We've held a, a, fund, a donation drive for families of arson. There are several fires, uh, about six or seven families were displaced. And so we worked with, it, this was in the Pilsen community over on um, 18th and or yeah about 18th street and as such uh, we worked with community organizations so that we could uh, collect supplies clothes food uh, shoes um, we worked at the local YMCA right there on Western and 27th and we collected two rooms full of supplies within two days and uh, we were able to fully uh, clothe the uh, families uh, they were able to take whatever they wanted, and there was a surplus left over, which we are still currently trying to figure out what to do with. Um, so if anybody would like to help us move some of this stuff, or know some place where we can move this to, that will put it to a good, uh, put it to a good home, uh, we'll, we'll take it. And around this time, we were also organizing for the Renters' Day of Action, which was on, which was on September 22nd. And this Renters' Day of Action was a collaboration between 10, uh, 10 citywide organizations, as well as community organizations. So you have One North Side, uh, you had Pilsen Alliance, you had the Chicago Socialist Party, you had the National, or was it National Lawyers? No, it was, I can't believe I forgot the community organization's names. There's a lot of them. Uh, we met, we had organized this event for over a month. And we had met over at uh, downtown Daily Plaza. And we are continuing to push for rent control, uh, pushing for a just cause ordinance in the city of Chicago, as well as um, further ordinances that will protect the rights of workers and uh, renters from getting thrown out of their homes. 
and uh, having the homes foreclosed illegally. We've had a very busy month. <laughs> so, aside from organizing this, we've also been organizing uh, labor workshops, which we also uh, teach labor rights uh, with the Rise Chicago. Our speaker was Jorge Mujica. Uh, he was also our president, or not presidential, aldermanic candidate for the 25th Ward, which we ran in 2015, or no, 2014, uh, as our aldermanic candidate with the ISO, the DSA, and Socialist Alternative, and multiple other organizations. It was the first uh, Chicago, Social, so, Chicago Socialist campaign was the first uh, truly radical political campaign which saw the collaboration of multiple uh, socialist organizations working together for a common goal to elect a single candidate for office. We won 12% of the vote. And uh, this man is a very active member of the community. He was one of the organizers of the immigration rally in 2006. So we had him come and we had him give, us, give a, a workshop on bouncing checks for laborers. And that's one of our campaigns as well, in addition to, uh, which is part of our labor campaign. As for the Young People Socialist League, we, it's a relatively new organization. We rebranded it as a Chicago local youth organization. It's no longer a national uh, youth affiliate. It's not a Chicago Socialist Party affiliate. Although I believe we have one branch over in Moore Park, California. And right here in Chicago, we're actively building the Young People Socialist League to be a revolutionary socialist organization, um, which fights to work, get youth involved in our communities, and to get our youth involved in uh, radical politics. And that's pretty much what we've had up to date so far. And. Um, if anybody has any questions, okay. I'd be happy to answer. Okay. All right. Let's have a warm round of applause for our students. Oh, Miguel, I forgot to tell you before the program. Actually, um, actually, what I do, the way we work here at the College of Complexes is that um, you'll, of course, answer the questions because you're the speaker, but I, uh, I I call on the people. So who, who all has a question? Just Ron, there are, there are, I would like to remind you that there are two, two microphones. Do you may want to grab yeah, uh, questioners. Yeah, but I can hear, oh, you mean one for the person asking the question? Right, right. Okay, okay, great. I'll just do the Phil Donahue thing then. And, and, yeah. I'll do, hey, can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I can, I'll just do the Phil Donahue thing and hand the mic to the to the person asking the question. That, is that cool with you? That's fine. Okay, all right, all right. Hey, all right, who has a question? Okay, Gene, go ahead, here. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Oh, you know, classically, socialism is supposed to uh, be the idea that the community would own the means of production, distribution, and exchange. Own and control. Is that your ultimate goal, or is your ultimate goal something less, like... Uh, social welfare state like they have in the Nordic states. What is So are you with the dictionary or are you with the Nordics or what? Well, how would you define socialism? Okay. Go ahead. Well, to answer that question, uh, we take the traditional sense of the socialist term. We wish for our communities to be the ones who control and own the means of production. Thank you. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Any any questions? All right. Well, oh, okay. Uh, Sid, here, go ahead. Uh, which government do you think right now is, in your opinion, the most socialist? Hmm, that's a tough one. So right now, as of today. I can't think of any country that truly, truly embraces the socialist model as this man described, where workers control the means of production and communities control the institutions of power. Oh, the closest? Yeah. I would have to say, I wouldn't be an entire state, but it would be in small places like uh, Chiapas, Mexico, 
I would say the closest we've had, and, and that's still existing to this day, uh, the town of Marina Leda in Spain is a great example of, of socialism, communism in, in action. Uh, even the state of Kerala, India, is actually very diverse and very, very progressive. Um, they have free democratic elections, where the Communist Party is one of the largest parties in the state, and there's eight, oh, about 8 million people in that state alone in India, which is amazing. Um, and so, so, I wouldn't say it's a single state per se, but in small pockets you see experiments going on. All right, um, all right. I see that uh, Ilana, you had a question, so I'm going to bring the mic over to you. Okay, you don't want to do that with the mic. Okay, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So my question is, are your organization working on, uh, like uh, Bernie Sanders was proposed free education, because students tired from those loans and, and they cannot pay back. And they, after all, they, some of them without job for many, many years. Are you working on it for free education, at least uh, reducing, and free medical care? Yes. Uh, I am actually uh, going to be, uh, well technically I am an incoming medical student at the University of Illinois Chicago. And uh, this is one of my highest, uh, I, uh, highest, I would say expectations. Priority. Highest priorities is to make uh, medical care one of the foundations of our Chicago local. Um, free health care is an absolute must. We need it. Free, full, socialized health care. Um, Obamacare merely forces workers to buy into corporate insurance companies. And it also allows a loophole for temporary workers to be denied health care by their, insur or by their um, employers. All they have to do is give them 39 hours instead of 40, and then it's considered a temp worker. Uh, as for the education issue, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Socialist Party USA is for full, free education for all. Um, and this is going to be one of our major tenets for a Young People Socialist League as well, one of our major campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, we have several members on the UIC campus, and we are organizing to not only uh, fully fund or get full funding for our campus, because right now, as of, as of right now, the state of Illinois has yet to pay a single dollar to UIC. Uh, since 2014, UIC has had no budget. And it's a state-funded, it's supposed to be a state-funded university. The medical school, the only reason why the medical school has been funded is because they have a hospital. But they've had 5% of the funding come from the state. Um, and this is something that needs to change because right now what's happening is, as a result, the UIC is starting to privatize its resources. It's starting to privatize its campus so it can get the money to pay for services and tenure. Um, because there's no state budget going towards the, the, the wages. Uh, I learned about this when we started organizing to get workers on campus a pay raise for minimum wage, uh, to get 15 an 15 hour for, for the college workers. Uh, we confronted the dean about it, and the dean told us that there was no plan from, from, uh, from State Hall, or from the, from the Capitol, and that we haven't had any funding, which we didn't believe until we researched it ourselves. Um, so in which case, this is a real issue for us because uh, we have to go to the state or we have to fight the state just to get funding. And chances are we would have to fight the city as well for many other things. So this provides a, another layer of challenge. Thank you. Okay, Dave, Dave, did you have a question? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, if uh, socialism and communism has not worked in the Soviet Union, in Russia, or in uh, China, or in South America, or in Africa, how then do you expect that it would work here? Good question. In the past, the Soviet Union, and considering Soviet Union and China, they are models to be looked at to be studied, but ultimately to be understood as uh, state capitalist societies. Uh, we do not believe that they represent in any way true socialism, or com even communism, because communism in the traditional Marxian sense requires the state to have uh, vanished completely. Uh, it requires workers and communities to control the means of production, which 
what did not exist at all and under any so-called communist systems and societies. Um, as for Latin America, we may very well have seen socialism blossom and flourish in, in Latin America if the United States hadn't overthrown pretty much every single uh, presidential or democratically elected uh, leftist in office, and, or, or funded death squads, or funded dictators like Pinochet who overthrew Salvador Allende, who was democratically elected socialist. So we have yet to see a socialist society, a truly socialist state, rise up because quite frankly it has been denied on multiple occasions through overt and covert uh, sabotage. If, um, if I may just ask a follow-up question to that. What's, um, Try the other uh, what do you think about, uh, about uh, President Hugo Chavez of uh, Venezuela? Mm. Try the other one. Try the other one. Oh. No, no, no. Yeah, you know, let, let hand down the other mic. No, no, not, not that one, the one in your I don't understand your instructions, Tim. Switch the microphones around. Oh, okay, you want me to put this one over here yeah. and turn this one on. Well, I have actually a real loud voice. The red light is on. What does that okay, mean? Okay, that means it's on. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? I guess yeah. you can. All right. What uh, What do you think about President Hugo Chavez of Venezuela? Hugo Chavez himself uh, conflicted. <laughs> he does. He did not represent the the full socialist ideal. However, I, we do admire the fact that many agrarian farmers saw their livelihoods improve greatly under his uh, system. Even now, uh, under Maduro, a lot of farmers continue to uh, benefit, although the problem lies with the so-called with the shortage of supplies in Venezuela right now. And this also has a hallmark of CIA sabotage. If you look back to the events of Chile in the days before the overthrow of Salvador Allende, the CIA funded uh, truck drivers to stop their cars and to protest. They funded with help of the elites and the wealthy capitalists of their own society of Chile to shut down businesses, to, to purposely destroy their own goods and wares, and to purposely hide them and sell them on the black market to increase their cost, to, in, to increase the misery and the suffering of the people so that they can maintain their own power and the status quo. And this is a straight up uh, tactic taken out of the CIA playbook that you see playing out again in Venezuela. Um, while we are not supported, while we do not support Hugo Chavez officially at all, we also recognize that the people truly want a socialist change in Venezuela. And we realize that the people are being thwarted at every effort by not only the United States, but the capitalists and the businessmen of Venezuela as well, which will stop at nothing, even at the cost of human life, to maintain power. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, who else has a question? Uh, uh, Jan, did you have, no? Okay, anybody else? Okay, Charlie, all right. Oh, I don't need that. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, there are two clear choices in the upcoming election, Miguel, and it's either between Trump and this guy Gary Johnson and the Libertarians or the Socialist Party, and could you help me out? I'm an undecided voter. <laughs> I would say to vote your conscience. Uh, definitely, definitely not Trump. That's an obvious answer. Uh, definitely not Hillary either. And Gary Johnson is a joke. Uh, no, he is not fit to run the country at all. Um, the, the the only way we can get past this system is to ignore the the presidential elections. I don't believe that in any possible way that these will benefit the working class in any sense. Either way, you're going to see your wages docked. Either way, you're going to see your environment plundered. Either way, people are still going to get murdered by police. Either way, we're going to continue to see our economic system worsen and worsen while not only our population rises, but also scarcity of resources. And unless there is a complete systematic change to not only the system, but to our own culture and to our own mindset, we will never begin to change the system. Okay, um, all right. 
Anybody else have a question? Oh, no, I do. just a moment. Go here, ahead. Let me, I'm going to bring the microphone over here. Go. Okay, you say that if socialism um, comes about, it will not be through elections. Um, are, are you advocating, like, some kind of overthrow or a violent overthrow of government? <laughs> what, what are you advocating? I'm a little confused. We advocate for whatever works. <laughs> whatever gets power to the people's hands as quickly as possible, we support. Do you mean like, when you say power to the people's hands, do you mean like the direct democracy? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, like where each person has a vote on every issue or something like that? Yes. Like we, we, we believe in direct democracy. We believe in community control of all institutions and resources as well as the community's decisions on how these are implemented, how the resources are used, as well as direct democratic organization of the workforce. Okay. Okay, Tim. Uh, I would like to know where you stand on the following four issues that the presidential candidates are not talking about. The first one is what is the socialist plan to cope with the increasing globalization? The second corollary to that question is, what are the socialists going to do to cope with the increasing information technology revolution? The third part is, what are you going to do about the increasing budget deficits? And the fourth corollary to that question is, what are you going to do about climate change and about sustainable living. Feel free to remind me about the other corners. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> the first one is how are we going to cope with globalization? Yes. So, how we would cope with globalization? The phenomenon of globalization that has occurred, especially in the neoliberal politics, has been around for at least 50 years. Um, since the end of World War II, since we ended our isolation space, technically we've been in a globalized um, pace for a globalized economy. Uh, in recent years, we've seen it expand in an exponential way uh, to the detriment of workers, not only in our own country, but to the workers in the countries that the businesses often inhabit. Uh, the jobs that have been shut down in Detroit moved out to China, where workers suffer 12-hour work days, if not more, uh, horrible pay, horrible working conditions. And this phenomenon does not seem to stop. Okay. So we believe that until we start beginning the transition to a society where we start <coughs> allowing for direct democracy and direct voice in our politics, we will continue to see our jobs, we will continue to see autom our automation of our workforce, we will continue to see the um, horrible working conditions of not only our own workers increase, but also those overseas. And it is very easy to, for, for a worker to become quite irate with workers overseas and say that they're taking their jobs when the anger should be directed at the capitalists whose ultimate goal is the bottom line, which is that of profit. So our enemy, our, our anger, and our force should be directed not at those who may increase our, or may talk about policy, but those who actually uh, dock our pay, which is capitalists, the owners of the factories. Uh, we need direct action. We need to take over these workplaces democratically. Um, as for automation, the second corollary to your question. Right. Information technology. Information technology. Um, and automation and... And automation. Essentially, tech. Technology, just to a socialist, to a communist, is supposed to be a good thing. Uh, to a communist, to a socialist, we want to have robots to take over the jobs and the monotonous, job, or monotonous duties that, frankly, we don't want to do. Um, unfortunately, under a capitalist system, technology is misguided and misused. Instead, for providing benefit and surplus for the workers, so that you will allow workers more free time for leisure. We use this so that we can increase the uh, increase our profit margins and to um, serve the bottom line, which is that of shareholder profits. Under a socialist system, we would have a full automation of labor, 
and which is monotonous, which would be uh, difficult, as well as uh, jobs that require very fine skill. Uh, however, to get to that phase, we would need to start organizing. We would need to start uh, looking at options, what we can do to organize our workplaces. And the thing is, we will not be allowed to do that by voting into office. They will never let us vote that in. Um, never, never believe the fact that you can vote the, we vote the wealth away from the wealthy because they will never allow it. Uh, so the, the real way, the, the, the real answer that a socialist, any socialist worth their self would give you is to organize. To organize, take over the workplace by any means necessary, and to build communities which are self-sustaining, and to one day be able to reach a point where we'll be able to use technology, information technology, which we consider uh, the detriment of our society right now to our benefit. The budget deficit. As for the budget deficit. The budget deficit we have in our society right now, um, I'm not sure what the exact numbers are, but the budget that we have is highly inflated, mainly due to our military industrial complex. Uh, the vast majority of your dollars, for, for every dollar you, you spend uh, paying your taxes, goes to war, goes to weapons of war, weapons of destruction. And as pacifist as may sound, I'm no pacifist. I believe that is an unnecessary amount that we should spend on any military uh, hardware whatsoever. Um, our tax budget is inflated, and then on top of that, politicians and businessmen point the fingers at the poor, at those who so-called mooch off the system, while in fact the ones who mooch off the system the most are the ones who make billions and possibly even trillions uh, off the misery and the suffering and the exploitation of labor. Those are the mooches that we have to fight. There are only two kinds of people in this world, those that work and those that don't. We work, they don't. Simple. And as such, we have to remember that the poor are not our enemies. We cannot keep, continue to degrade the poor, make them feel miserable, make them feel like it was their fault that they are poor, and realize that the true enemies of society, of the worker, are the wealthy, the capitalists, and the businessmen. All right, and then the fourth is climate change and sustainable living. Climate change and sustainable living. Climate, uh, the, the current issue we have uh, with climate issues, uh, or uh, climate change, is actually quite dire. I believe just recently we, uh, we passed the supposed point of no return. Uh, I remember reading a couple articles about that. The degradation of our environment is directly linked to the direct exploitation by capitalist corporations. And this has existed since the foundation of capitalism, uh, since the industrial era. And the thing about capitalism is that it requires exponential growth with exponential profits, with no seemingly end in sight. Uh, with capitalism, you cannot stop for one second, because if you do, you will bust. So what this does, it creates a culture in which you have to more thoroughly exploit the environment, more thoroughly exploit the workers, more thoroughly exploit every resource possible to ensure that your bottom line is met and grows. Now, this system is unsustainable. There is no, there is no example of an infinitely expanding exponential system in nature. Uh, it will eventually collapse. And the thing is, we're beginning to see the detrimental effects in our environment right now, and this is very concerning because this, this affects all of us. Every single person in this room, every single person on this planet. So, what needs to happen is we need to, we need to address the current issues at hand, say oil pipelines, the amount of carbon that's being used, not only uh, in the US, but China, Russia, um, India, uh, many other developed nations around the world that are rising up through the use of industrialized labor. Um, so long as you have a capitalist society on growth, you will have pollution and you will have exploitation. There's no way you can have a green capitalist society because it costs too much and that affects the bottom line. 
So under a socialist society, we would create technology, we would embrace it, just like the autom automation, the information technology, embrace it, and we must utilize it so that we, we can increase the ability of us to, uh, uh, of not only the surplus of our, of our product, whatever that product may be, but also to ensure that it is sustainable and also that it's non uh, polluted for our environment. All right. Uh, anybody else have a question? Uh, Dan. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering. How would you get the car companies and oil companies to change their ways? <laughs> Tear them down. <laughs> so, this is a t <laughs> that this is a tough question because uh, when we talk about oil companies, when we talk about coal companies, uh, this isn't just shutting down the plants. Uh, do just doing so would immediately throw thousands of workers into desperation and poverty. Um, and we're not just talking about the workers working at the factories. If we're talking about coal, we're talking about the people that mine the coal. We're talking about the managers. We're talking about the workers. We're talking about the, the transporters, the people that drive the trucks. There's an exponential, or not exponential, but there is a web of, um, I wouldn't say, reper there's a web of repercussions that you would have if you just simply uh, say shut down coal. What needs to happen is a transfer and this transfer needs to happen. The thing is businessmen will not allow it to happen unless it's in their profit. Um, which, is, which is frustrating because it does not give us much freedom or much leeway other than to tear down the system and build a new one. Um, we can't legislate. The, the, any kind of legislation, any kind of reform that you you make will be taken down. Uh, if you try to fight them, the pigs and the military will stop you. Uh, the only way you can do something is if people actually get together and organize. And when I say organize, that means people have to create alternative systems outside of what we live in right now. That means alternative schools, alternative uh, institutions of government, and be able to work from the bottom up. This isn't going to happen overnight and this is not uh, being able to just switch off the uh, s switch off the need for oil and coal will not happen overnight uh, there's no simple answer to this question um, and so we have to keep a sober keep this in mind we have to be sober about this and we have to understand that ultimately what everything boils down to is we need to organize um, if not for human rights for our own very survival because without this we are going to be screwed. Okay. All right, now uh, is there anybody else who has a question? I mean, I know Dave had his hand up and Ellen has, has a question, but is there anyone who has a question who has not already asked a question? No? All right, then I'm going to give the microphone to Dave. Okay, here you are. Uh, to the extent, well, let me stop a moment. The United States used to be very capitalist. Uh, to the extent that the United States has adopted certain socialist policies, uh, income tax uh, uh, under uh, Woodrow Wilson and um, Social Security under Franklin Roosevelt, and uh, and now uh, uh, national health care under Obama and so on, then why is it that to the extent that we have adopted socialist programs, the standard of living has actually gone down? Things have gotten worse for the people. <coughs> I believe the answer to that question lies in the fact that uh, merely taxation is not socialism. It's not socialism at all. Uh, it, and, I mean, feudal systems tax their people. I mean, the Roman Empire taxed their own people. Uh, taxation does not warrant socialism. And it is important to remember that taxes, most of your taxes go directly to corporations and subsidies for businessmen and politicians. Um, and the corporations that they're affiliated with. 
So even even as we're taxed more, we don't see our quality of standard, our, our, our quality of life increase because the money that we're constantly being taxed goes directly to the support of the capitalist system. Um, Increase, there, there has been complete de deregulation of our environment, uh, environmental protection. There has been complete deregulation of the banking industry. And there has been a complete deregulation of pretty much every aspect of our economy um, to the benefit of corporations. Um, and some may call this corporatism, I call this capitalism because quite frankly, capitalism cannot exist without the state enforcing its policies. You need a state to enforce evictions, you need a state to enforce property laws, you need a state to enforce uh, your whatever, uh, what do you call those, uh, intellectual property, patent laws. Uh, without the state, without the pigs, and without the military, uh, you would not be able, uh, capitalists would not be able to regulate anything on their own, and they would not be able to have the power that they have. Um, it is actually the state that is in collusion with the businessmen, this is what constitutes the capitalist system. This is what we're trying to fight against. It's not only the capitalist corporations, but also the state. Any bourgeois capitalist state that supports the capitalist system is also a capitalist. Um, so, the socialist, there's, you can't enact socialist policies. Um, socialism isn't something that you can just pick and choose and you can just add to a, uh, add to a government to make it so-called more liberal. Uh, it's all or nothing. You either have a socialist society or you don't. Um, you can have a welfare state, a uh, capitalist society like Scandinavia. It's still capitalist even though they still have uh, high worker um, wages. They have like maternal leave, they have uh, paid vacations. But this is still a capitalist society because ultimately the power resides within the capitalist state as well as the uh, corporations. Um, so this is pretty much the definition of capitalism is uh, businessmen who have to rely on those with institutional power to propagate their wealth. This happened back when uh, capitalism was founded when uh, merchants would work with feudal lords and will work with local parliaments to pass zoning laws which force workers to work in their factories. Um, ever since the beginning, capitalism has used the state to force workers into compliance. And this is something we have to uh, make known is that you cannot have aspects of socialism in a capitalist society. All right, uh, Ellen, did you have another question? I was wondering, you're talking about these community groups that would govern. How big, how big would these groups be, and who would determine how big they would be? Ooh. We're going to the hypothetical parts. <laughs> uh, this we cannot know, and, and the reason why, um, and I understand the reason why it seems like I don't have the answer because I really don't. Um, the communist society that will come about will come about through the actions of the people. The people themselves would be the ones to decide how big the organizations would be. They themselves would be the ones who would determine how their neighborhoods are organized, how their businesses are going to be organized, how their industries will be uh, in coordination with other industries. Um, there is no theoretical framework for this, even under Marxism. Uh, so, we take this as it goes along. Uh, it's, it's an evolutionary process. Uh, we take pitfalls, we take two steps forward, one step back, sometimes even three steps back. Uh, we learn from our mistakes and move on. Uh, our point, the point of history is to learn from it, to learn our mistakes, what worked, what didn't, and to uh, hopefully be able to apply them in the future. So when it comes to uh, situations where we want to guess, say, what, would, what a socialist society would look like, no one can really say, um, because it's, it, it can completely vary. It, it can be different in a tribal setting, it can be different in a city-wide setting, it can be different in a country-wide or a small town setting. Um, we truly don't know until we start to see it unveil, which is, to me, a little exciting uh, to be able to hopefully see small microcosms of socialism pop up and be able to see how they organize.
to be able to analyze and interpret. So it's kind of a form of anarchism, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yes. If you talk about communism, communism is essentially anarchism. Um, a stateless society run by workers' councils. Um, some might call it councilism, or but essentially, it's it's all communism, where so long as you have the workers control the means of production and community control the means of production, it is a communist society, socialist society, or anarchist society. Ultimately, when they all boil down to it, socialism is merely the transitional state from capitalism to communism, in which case communism is essentially anarchism. There are some differences, but they're essentially meaningless, ultimately, if you boil it down to the um, bare bones. Okay, uh, I had a follow-up question to that, since, you, since you, you mentioned the phenomenon of worker councils. Um, what do you think about the, uh, the worker councils in Germany, the, the worker councils and also the co-determined boards? Are you familiar with that? I am afraid I am not. All right. All right, well, I'll, I'll explain, I'll explain for, the, for the audience here. In Germany, if a corporation is over a certain size, if it has over a certain Your number. Voice is kind of All right. Well, I'm going to turn this thing off. I'm not a big fan. Of, I no, no. I'm not a big fan of technology, and I have a very loud voice. So um, I just wanted to say that okay. In in Germany, there's a law that if a corporation has over a certain number of employees, they're required to. Uh, to have worker councils, uh, that is, that is each local shop or office of uh, uh, of the uh, of of the company has to have a worker council where the workers meet and they and they and they they make decisions by voting. They make de democratic decisions on how that local shop will be governed. Uh, in addition to that, they also elect people to the board of directors of the corporation. So that, for example, instead of in, in, a, in an American corporation, half of the members of the board of direct, uh, okay, in an American corporation, the board of directors represent the stockholders. In a German corporation like Volkswagen or, or Daimler Benz, half of the board of directors are elected by the company's employees. The other half represent the stockholders. So, um, so you're, what do you think about that? That is very interesting. I've never heard of something like no, that. No, it's, it's, it's not something that gets reported very much in, 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 in the media here. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I, I have a master's degree in, his, in, in, in history with a specialization in Germany, and I didn't find out about it until after I got out of school. Okay. All right. Uh, so, since you're going off this, the format, it was tried here for a period of eight years to a limited extent uh, under the Clinton um, administration. And in, in the United States, it was termed a partnership. Yes, and in certain industries, the partnerships were formed and undertook direction of the, exactly what he described. And I served on them. So, but it was tried here, but with the new administration that uh, Republicans came in and that was <coughs> into some sort of Republican mother world, never to be heard of again. Go ahead. All right, uh, does anybody else have any questions? Um, all right. Well, if there are no more questions, and let's have uh, let's have a big. Oh, I had one more question. I had one more question. What uh, what do you think about what what do you think about Bernie Sanders? Good. Uh, uh, I like the fact that he popularized the idea of socialism in public discourse. Uh, I, I'm not much of a fan of social democracy myself. Um, to me, it's still capitalism. Uh, and especially the use of patriotism in his dialogue really concerned me. Um, I'm not a patriot at all. Um, I'm not a nationalist. I'm more of an internationalist myself. Do you want both of those? Uh, do you want either one? No. I do like the fact that he inspired hope in many people. And right now, that hope is being diverted into um, more progressive 
platforms, and people are starting to reject the two-party system. I do admire that. Um, but I think he's kind of a sheepdog for the Democratic Party. A sheepdog? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Uh, usually, the, they're, they're progressive candidates throughout history, which will garner a lot of popular populist uh, mm -hmm. energy and be able to rouse the people and then ultimately end up trying to force them back into the Democratic Party, into the shambling corpse that is the Democratic Party. And I kind of expected this from Bernie Sanders in the very beginning and it turned out to be true when he not only supported Hillary Clinton but called for voters to um, support Hillary Clinton because Donald Trump. Uh, that same tired old argument that's been used by most liberals. And he can't say I'm much of a fan of someone who would use their ideals to somehow support an institution that uh, supports the uh, exploitation and the murder of innocent people. What do you mean by that? Uh, he ran for the Democratic Party. He supports Hillary Clinton. So you believe that the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton stand for the exploitation and murder of innocent people? Absolutely. How? Uh, well, for one, the Democratic Party was involved in one of the mass, one of the most massive deportation events in U.S. history under Obama. Uh, nobody really talks about that, but Obama has deported more people than any president in U.S. history. Um, under a democratic presidency, we've seen Obama bomb innocent civilians from Yemen, Somalia, Libya, uh, Syria, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and several other nations, including Palestine as well. And we, we continue to support, under a democratic presidency, uh, regimes that exploit and murder innocent people, which makes us just as guilty as them, because uh, we extend our political support and at the same time for the governments that we find politically uh, inconvenient we simply overthrow them like we did with Gaddafi in Libya and uh, Bashar al-Assad or we tried to do in Syria. Um, we, th this is a tried and true method that we've seen uh, especially in Iraq um, and under Obama he's been one of the greatest war criminals of modern times. Um, Bill Clinton was no better. He gutted, he supported NAFTA, uh, which gutted the workers here in the United States and also caused the immense amount of poverty and misery for workers in Latin America, primarily Mexico, and uh, also increased massive incarceration of our African Americans in our inner cities. Uh, the policies of the Democratic Party do not represent those of the working man or woman. Uh, they represent the interests of the elite, of capitalists, and those who exploit, murder, cheat, and steal from people all around the world to maintain their wealth. Okay. Uh, all right. Oh, wait. We have one other question from Charlie. Let me just hand up the microphone to you, Charlie. Right. Do I really need that? All Probably right. not. Probably not. Here, here all right. I can handle the technology. Right. According to the literature you gave me, sir, I got at the table. It says here, if I vote Socialist Party, you will provide all the necessities of life, including food, shelter, health care, education, child care, social sir and cultural opportunities how do you expect to do that i mean i get to go to the theater too show that should that be great um to be honest the socialist party usa is not a party that promises people that we have not only have the answers or that we will be able to provide these solutions we believe that it is the people themselves organizing together as a working class to overthrow the repressors will be able to be the ones to not only emancipate themselves, but to also create their own instru in instruments of power and instruments of change that will allow them to uh, create the so-called um, free food and free health care and all the free programs that they wish. Uh, our job is merely to facilitate in this uh, 
in this organization process and to also help in creating class consciousness and awareness among the people uh, so that we can help organize and at least provide some part in the revolution to come to help organize the people for their own liberation. Okay, okay. All right. All right. Is that it? All right. I think that's it. Okay. Move on to rebuttals, Don. All right, let's get into the rebuttal period. Okay, well, let's have, okay, well, listen, thank you very much. One more warm round of applause for our speaker. All right. All right. All right, now, um, okay, now, how many people wish to give a rebuttal speech? Everybody wants to give a rebuttal speech? Raise your hand. Okay, it's one, two, three, four, five. Uh, I'm going to count myself as six, so that's uh, six people. Uh, how much time do you think? Oh, about seven minutes apiece. Seven minutes. Oh, okay. So you, you think that'll do it? Well, let's keep it down to five minutes so that we All don't right, run five, over time. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, five, five minutes. It's, that's our usual time. Okay. Who, who, go, who wants to be the first victim? All right. All right. Okay, Gene, go ahead. Okay, I just... Um, oh, never mind. He's got, I'm going to vote socialist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks for a very, very interesting presentation. I think the speaker uh, was excellent and not raising his voice. What he pretty much said is uh, those people who believe that the United States is the greatest country in the world every way and every day are full of it. Um, I do want to uh, speak to a couple of things. Uh, social welfare, I agree with the speaker, social welfare is not socialism. The Nordic countries are pretty nice places. You don't see a bunch of people from Iceland and uh, Denmark and Norway fighting like crazy, risking their life to get into the United States. <laughs> Let's face some facts. In fact, the only one I know, I know one guy from my church who married a lady from Finland, and they went back to Finland, and they haven't come back. So uh, that's one thing. Uh, but social welfare and Community organizing kind of go together. The speaker talked about community organizing, certainly a lot different than uh, the community organizing I uh, am engaged in. But the idea of democracy, and we don't have, in my opinion, that much of it in the United States anymore. Maybe freedom, but not democracy, not uh, we've got so many restrictions, and there are, what, 20 people here, and if we all got together and started talking about stuff, we'd find 20, 30, or 40, or 50 reasons why we don't have more democracy in the United States, whether it be the uh, electoral college, or two senators from every state, or uh, gerrymandering, or uh, Citizens United, and you know, you guys are got more ideas than I do, so you could add all those guys and ladies uh, into that. Uh, another thing I would suggest to the speaker, he might look at the book, A Force More Powerful by Ackerman and Duval, about nonviolent resistance. A lot of these things can do, be done by nonviolent resistance, and he mentioned that. He mentioned that the two things they say nonviolent resistance does is refuse to cooperate and then take over the services that were provided. And the, the speaker kind of said both of those things. So I would uh, suggest the speaker, he might look at that, uh, at that particular book, Ackerman and Duval. <coughs> A force more powerful. But uh, I think this is really interesting that he didn't raise his voice and he said such horrible things about our country. It's, it's amazing. Unfortunately, 
I'm not very far from his position. Thank you. All right. Well, let me say first uh, that I'm for socialism, like the main speaker was talking about. I don't agree on all, all the aspects of what he's talking about. I think Cuba is probably one of the most progressive countries in the world. It's, it calls itself socialist. Of course, no country is actually socialist at this point in history, because most countries are just too damn poor to be socialist. You have to have an economic base for socialism. And the only countries that got that is probably Western Europe, the United States, and the Scandinavian countries for the most part. So socialism is a long way off. But if we're talking about pollution, it's only about 10% of the population of this planet that causes all the pollution, or most of it. The rest of us don't. We're 5% of the population in the United States, and even the 5% don't cause all the pollution. The capitalists, some of them have three, four, five homes, maybe 10 homes, five or six or seven cars. They have servants that do every little thing for them. They exploit everything they possibly can. If they want to have like chickens, for instance, what they do is they take the chickens and they transport it to a third world country, have them take off the feathers and everything, and then bring it back to the United States and use all that fossil fuel to do it. That's one of the biggest pollutions in the world. The United States has its airplanes, its ships, and all its, uh, all its production of uh, munitions all over the world that's causing a lot of pollution. It has oh, airplanes right. in the air constantly, ships constantly at sea, atomic submarines constantly at sea. It causes quite a bit of the pollution of the, United, of the world. Of course, China does too, but China is producing far more solar panels than any place in the world. Now, as far as people that support capitalism, most of them have been indoctrinated to such a degree that they don't know any better, or some of them, they have a certain benefit out of capitalism. Some of them might own homes, and small pieces of property, or things that have nature, and they think, oh, capitalism is my system. Look how good I'm doing. But if you look at Latin America, you look at Asia, and look at Africa, they're not doing very good there, I'll tell you that. And they hardly cause any pollution, hardly anything at all. Uh -huh. So the people that benefit from it, or think they benefit from it, they're the ones that, uh, that support this type of uh, exploitation of the world's resources and the world's labor. If the capitalists didn't have anybody working for them, they wouldn't have any wealth. They're basically parasites that live off of people's labor. And that's essentially what they are. They're nothing more. As far as um, what he was talking about, as far as uh, people in the cabinet, Robert Reich was in Clinton's cabinet, and he wrote a book, Locked in the Cabinet. So while he was a labor secretary in the cabinet, he hardly had anything to say that influenced the cabinet itself. It's just a phony way of showing that the, that the workers are part of the uh, ruling class, which is nonsense. All right. You know, I sit here again tonight, hearing about all this socialist stuff, and I'm thinking to myself, here we go again. All the big time modern corporations, yeah. it's all the government's fault, and it's all based on the evil businessmen around the world. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, guess <laughs> what? Those big time evil businessmen are what provide employment 
for you and me. Those guys provide jobs. They provide the methodization of innovation. The biggest fear that most modern corporations have is competition. And capitalism, under its best form, provides competition. What we have in a lot of cases today is special favors granted to corporations, government favoritism, and a lot of corporate welfare that needs to be addressed and taken care of. The problem is with most other countries is not capitalism in and of itself, is that there's not enough capitalism. And the reason I say this is because in the United States, we take it for granted, our property rights. I'm going to be very quick. I can walk into almost any place in the United States, say, hey, I'll uh, give, I'll want to buy something on credit. Well, they're not going to trust me, but they will trust this, a credit card that links to a database that has my account information that I can link to. How do I know that when I sell a car, it's my car? It's done through a database called the titles that cars have. If you own a piece of property, there's something called a title deed that's registered with the government that is bought and sold through transfer systems. This is what the basis of capitalism is. It's where you know you each have a stable form of address. You have a form or something that designates the place of ownership. And in many of foreign countries, that means of ownership is only recognized by maybe the local tribal council or maybe certain societal members, but not as universally as it would be in some advanced capitalist countries. Sweden is probably the best, I mean, not Sweden, I'm sorry, uh, one of the best places that can tell you how capitalism can flourish is in Singapore. They started off with a system of land reform, giving the land to the farmers and the owners of those areas. Yes, it was heavily regulated under the dictatorship for a while, but because there was clear ownership given the opportunities for people to succeed because now they own stuff rather than renting it or thinking it was done by somebody else has a tendency to make people blossom. And normally most capitalistic states are controlled by something called the pricing mechanism. The other thing you have to realize is that, you know, a lot of these problems that I had mentioned, overpopulation, when a country prospers and a kid does not become a source of labor but an, but an investment or a cost, you're not going to have as many. The average cost today to raise a child is about half a million dollars. And you're not going to have eight or nine children when you have to spend half a million dollars for each. So as you prosper, more the overpopulation problem goes down. Now, energy consumption and oil. Renewables won't cut it. We're going to need some form of safe, effective nuclear power. I've outlined this in the past. I do believe that's going to be done in the form of thorium molten salt reactors or some other kind of thing. But just imagine if we could get a cheap, low cost, somewhat decentralized form of energy that will really bring the cost of electric power down to where most people could afford it. A lot do now. But it's not that capitalism doesn't work. It's just that when you have power concentrated like we do today, we, the people at the top, have benefited immensely through the benefits of special laws, <coughs> favoritism, and other things. My time is up, and I hope I've brought a little clarification to this issue. All right. All right. No, a lot more now than I did before. Okay, Charlie, let's hear your rebut. I had a lot more.
All right, let's thank our speaker again for coming out here. I'm only going to focus on one real issue here, which I think I can think. I want to talk about just on one. I'm not going to be eclectic tonight. Oh, yay! Ooh, no, no, no. Now, I heard the assertion that uh, this is a tiresome one, uh, that socialism and communism was tried in this country or that country and failed. Um, and let's look at this statement now. Well, why was socialism or communism tried in those countries? if capitalism was working so well. Could it possibly be that there was a revolution and the people saw change and the capitalist free market system was not meeting their basic needs? I gave a list there. Uh, obviously, it was not functioning. Now, did it fail? In both countries, Anyone who would maintain the claim, let's say China, both China and Russia take the basic standard of living, the living conditions in the country as a whole, from once it began to 75 or 100 years into, into the year after the date of their revolutions, and to say that conditions had not improved significantly is not substantiated by the facts. As a matter of fact, conditions improved significantly. Equalities were, were instituted. Uh, opportunities existed for people. They had literally lived as slaves. Uh, my family traced its heritage to one of those countries. To state that, uh, that things were worse, and that it failed, I don't know what you, what you mean by failure. The failure, the, the reason it came about. Now the other thing is that capitalism and free market capitalism and democracy, I guess is what you're saying, exists without perfectly where it's tried. And we can go back to the ancient Greeks at the institu institution of democratic form of government and free enterprise, free market. Do you realize how many countries in the history of mankind, that that system failed yes. completely and took thousands and thousands and thousands of countries. The people were overthrown. Those in charge were overthrown. Why? Because it didn't function. It did not work. Now, as a matter of fact, a logical person, like a student of history, if I were to sit down and say, what form of government should we have, such as Madison was entrusted with having to do, I probably would absolutely come to the conclusion that the democratic free market capitalism is possibly the one that you want to avoid at all circumstances. <laughs> as the one that failed more than any other, and resulted in total inequality and misery for the people. Now, this actually maintain, as some political parties do, that this, this type of system should be advanced, or it is the, is the one that we should have, is just not substantiated by any historical fact. It really isn't. The other thing I want to bring to mind is, what happened in those other countries? Whether, whatever it took place in those other countries isn't what's going to take place in the United States. Because we have our own culture. We have our own heritage. We have our own demographics. We have our own value system. We have our own form of government for implementing change. So what went on there is most certainly relevant, and we can learn about it but it does not determine the outcome here in any way, shape, or form of what form of socialism or communism that we implement in the United States. We can do whatever we want. We have not lost control of our country. And a matter of fact, I think the United States, given this history that we can rely on, 
and our ability to do things a little bit better than other countries are probably going to come up with the best form of communism and socialism that has ever been seen on the earth. And this guy says my time is up. I'm trying to change the history of the United States, but he says I got to get going. But anyhow, I hope I laid to rest this tiresome thing once and for all that is a pretty simplistic observation on social organization and history. What we do in this country is dependent upon all of us here, and if you can, you can vote in, in November for Hillary and bring it about, or vote for somebody else. Thank you. Hillary Jackson. All right. He doesn't know where to laugh all of us. He couldn't name one foreign leader. All right. Uh-uh. All right. Excuse me. Get the government out of your pocket, book it out of your bedroom. Wait, wait, no, no, no. Mr. Travis. Go, 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 Mr. Hey, Travis. Hey. You got you got yeah. a free open mic. Yeah. They have a woman. <laughs> you know they had a woman running the army? Let's welcome Dave. Who's that? Okay. Hey. They had a woman. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I, I really don't want to um, uh, get into a broad dispute of uh, socialism and communism and that sort of thing. Uh, I, it, it is certainly not my cup of tea. I'm very much a uh, capitalist and I uh, am a libertarian and I'll be voting libertarian in this next election. Yes. But uh, I'm going to attack this from one small point. Uh, if you go back to the early days of our republic here in America, we had a, uh, a universal form of money that was accepted any place in the world, <laughs> and that was called gold. Was called uh, and our gold standard lasted. <laughs> and our gold standard lasted all the way up until about 1937. Uh, I'd like to challenge any of you to take this test. Uh, find an old newspaper from the 1920s and look up the prices of a dozen eggs, uh, a man's suit of clothes, a, a fine pair of men's shoes, etc. Take all these things and make a list and then look in a, today's paper and see what the price is on them and then see what the price was in those days. Then take a, um, uh, an ounce of gold at today's value, today's price, and then um, uh, cut that gold up, keep dividing it until you come up with a small enough amount to pay for a new pair of shoes, uh, a dozen eggs, and so forth, and you'll find that for the most part, uh, it's about the same. There's not a whole lot of difference. Uh, so gold is truly a store of value. And if man is to be sovereign in a free society, then he has to have strength. He has to be powerful. And um, a, uh, a money like gold, a gold standard, enables the individual to be sovereign. When your money has become eroded in value over the years to the point that uh, it doesn't mean much, then the individual loses his strength and his sovereignty. sovereignty. And so that is one of the um, uh, really weak spots of socialism that I want to point out at this point is that uh, they always try to kill the, the value of the money and put in a kind of a fiat money. And every country that has uh, promoted a fiat money has generally gone down the drain. And that's all I want to say tonight. Okay. All right. All right, next we got an open mic. Please. All right, who else, who else would like to speak? Oh, excuse me. Hey, hey, guys, 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 no fighting, okay? Just, oh, just we're not fighting. This is my friend. What? Go get on. Okay, okay. All right. All right. 
Um, okay, all right, Brian. microphones. Okay, somebody. Okay, somebody was. Uh, all right, so, somebody was somebody was uh, using that microphone as a surrogate, something or other. Okay. Uh, all right. Does anybody uh, anybody else wish to give a rebuttal speech? All right. All right. Well, I just uh, say a few words. Uh, first of all, I'd like to again thank our speaker, uh, B, uh, Miguel del, del Toral, for speaking tonight. Yeah. It's a uh, very good uh, speech um, uh, talking about socialism. Now, um, you know, one of the things I took away from 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 tonight is that socialism means different things to different people. And that I think that Miguel's definition of socialism is probably not the same as Dave, Tra as Dave Travis's definition of socialism. Uh, just as an example, there are obviously there are people, I think Dave Travis considered um, the income tax and social security to be examples of socialism. Well, I think uh, Miguel was talking about the worker ownership of the means of production as, as socialism, which obviously those are not the same thing. And at the same time, there's been a lot of talk tonight in the rebuttal period about capitalism. And what I gather is that the term is that capitalism also means different things to different people. Um, my suspicion is that is that Miguel's definition of capitalism or SIDS is probably not the same definition of capitalism as, as Tim Bolger's. Yes. Uh, you agree with me, Tim. Yeah, so so again, capitalism means well, it's also... Be, it's because the other guys are wrong. Oh, well, okay, well, no, it's uh, no, it's it's just it's, it's a def different definition. Uh, and uh, and by the way, Tim, I would like to respectfully remind you of the rule one fool at a time. Good resist. Um, I'm afraid the... Uh, now, now, the... So, when you talk about so sometimes when you know people are talking at cross purposes when they talk about when they when they talk about capitalism versus <coughs> socialism because they're not even talking about the same thing. Um, you know, to to one person, capitalism may mean a restaurant like this. Uh, to another person, capitalism may mean you know. Uh, no bid contracts for Boeing at the taxpayer's expense. And and at, at the same time, to one person, socialism may mean um, uh, the kibbutzim in Israel, for example, in, in, or in, in pre-Israel pre pre Palestine. Uh, for, to another person, socialism may mean the Soviet Union under, under Stalin. So you know, it's just very different things we're talking about here. And now, I'm not going to get into whose definition is right and whose isn't, because obviously everybody, I, I, I'm actually trying to get away from even using these terms, because when I use these terms, I don't think people know what I'm talking about, because people, I say one thing, but if I use that word capitalism or that word socialism, people hear something else. Now, one of the, thing, one of the things I noticed, Tim mentioned, Tim mentioned the um, Singapore as a kind of ideal capitalist state. Well, Singapore is a dictatorship. Okay, the people can't the, the people can't vote in a different government with different policies. Um, I know Sid mentioned Cuba as a kind of ideal socialist state. Well, Cuba is also a dictatorship, and and and, and the, the the dictator of Cuba just recently handed it over to his younger brother, much as a king would do to his younger brother if he didn't have a son to pass the throne on to. So Cuba is actually something of a kingdom. Yes. Nice. And uh, and so so. Um, when you when you try to go when you have an ideology, what I've noticed is when people have an ideology and they don't want to compromise with others, they don't want to have to make deals, they want to go all the way with it. There's no way to do that other than by having a democracy. There's there's no way to do it other than through, uh, in in a democracy. In order to have it all your own way, whether it's all capitalism or all socialism, you have to have a dictatorship. You, you, you have to say, okay, people, you are not going to vote me out. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to decide how things are going to be here. Now, I'm not really for capitalism or socialism, whatever, however you may define it. What I actually am in favor of is democracy. And, and so I think for, in order for a democracy to function, people have to be willing to work together. People have to be willing... Uh, there, there has to be give and take because there, people are going to disagree, and and if if we can't if we can't respect each other's disagreements and we can't work out our differences, then we can't have a democracy. 
And now, yeah, now one of the things, and, and I think if you, and I think that uh, you mentioned Donald Trump, now I think that a lot of what our speaker said about US, uh, the United States and foreign policy is basically true, especially about what you said tonight about foreign policy, unfortunately, is, is very much true. Um, and, and the Democratic Party has become, I, I think our speaker is completely right, that the Democratic Party has over time become more and more pro-corporate. Part of that is because of where they get their funding from. See, both uh, major corporations in this country fund both the Democratic and Republican parties. Um, and so, but that doesn't mean there's no difference between the two major presidential candidates. Now, in the upcoming election, we're going to have two candidates. We're, one of two candidates is going to win. It's either going to be Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And now, our our speaker, here I would have to disagree with our speaker because he argued that that the that the, the Democrats won't do anything for the worker. Well, maybe. Depends on your, your definition again. But I can tell you this. The average person is going to be a lot worse off if Donald Trump becomes president. First of all, the Republican Party has promised to it intends to privatize Social Security. Okay, they already tried to do that. They also intend so no more Social Security. And second, they intend to repeal Obamacare. In fact, they would have done it already if, if Obama, if President Obama, didn't keep vetoing the bills they keep passing. Uh, so Trump will not veto such a bill. So this means that um, third. Um, uh, Medicare also probably will be privatized. So the result will be things. I agree with our speaker that things are not ideal now. And I believe I agree that things are not as they should be. However, in a Trump presidency, things are going to get a whole lot worse. And I see from my stop from my watch here that my time is up. So um, is does anybody else wish to speak? No. All right. Well, then with that. Oh, in that case, I will yield the floor to our speaker. Uh, Miguel uh, Del Toro, who gets to have the last word. So Miguel, come on down. He gets to rebut the rebutter to the last word. It's on. Is that cool? So I'd like to thank you all for having me. Uh, on behalf of the Socialist Party USA, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, for being here and helping participate in uh, learning a little bit more about our party as well as what we believe in. Um, we believe in uh, true democracy, radical democracy at the most fundamental form to the point where it's truly revolutionary. Um, a society in which we have democracy manifested in every aspect of our society. Um, we don't wish for any sort of dictatorship we do not wish for any sort of constitutional power in anyone's hands but the people's. Um, and when we say dictatorship of the proletariat, it is often used and misconstrued as some sort of actual literal dictatorship, when literally what it means is the ascendance of the people into power, a position of power to control the means of their own production, their own lives, to be able to institute the policies and be able to institute the reforms and the um, machine, uh, the technological advancements that will benefit not only themselves but future generations to come. And the uh, total power to be wrested in control or to be wrested from those in the capitalist society to be given to the people as a whole. Uh, never, never again to be given back to those for, or for those uh, to control privately for their own uh, private gain. So this is what we mean by dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, we do not mean a dictatorship in the literal sense of the term. Um, we have seen many instances in the past which have destroyed the notion of socialism and what it stood for. From this, we cannot deny and we cannot also uh, ignore. We have to look at all instances, both present, past, learn from them, 
and as socialism and communism are evolutionary systems, to use them to evolve. Uh, the ideal communism that Karl Marx had envisioned over 150 years ago is not going to be the communism that is going to come about. It's going to evolve. And this is because of our material conditions of our existence. Um, as technology improves, as our society changes, as the demographics of the world change, so too will the full, I wouldn't say, so too would the existence of actual socialism or communism. Um, it will change along those lines as well. So we must not be, we must not continue to live in the past and can instead continue to look forward to the future um, to ensure a society, a society of full democracy for all, a uh, true voice for all, where people have final rest in power, a uh, final say in um, what goes on in their daily lives. Uh, not just for the greater good of these people, but or for the people of that society, but for the greater good of all of humanity. Um, it is from this that I say that we should go forward and try to create a system where we ascend beyond this predatory and very selfish stage of human, human history and to be able to ascend into a new future in which we all create cooperative relations with each other um, based off of uh, humanity and compassion. Thank you. All right, well, the uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, and good night. Sweet dreams. Yes.